show you a little picture to start off our conversation today. So here we go. Most of you guys have probably heard this, but I wanted to show you. This is a picture of a knee. And so what it says, for those of you guys that are listening and not um, watching the actual um, stream yard, it says for every one pound lost, it removes four pounds of pressure off of your knees. Now let's talk about this really quick. How many of you guys have ever had made the statement, I have bad knees? Might be a little bit of validity to that. I'll give you an example. Um, I had my right knee fully reconstructed, ACL, the whole nine yards. Now I have a um, two bone spurs, a cyst, a little bit of torn cartilage in there. I call that a less than optimal knee, but I still don't have bad knees. I still do what I want to do, when I want to do, how I want to do it, run, jump, hike, squat, do all the things because of this key statement right here. I control my weight so that there's not added pressure on my knee. If I weighed an extra 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 pounds, this knee, me, I would have an issue. But it wouldn't be because I had a bad knee. Because I am not overweight and I can do everything I want to do with a knee that is that is suboptimal. It's a 50-year-old knee who's had a lot of trauma through years of sports, um, years of contact sports, and all kinds of things like that. But because my weight is under control, my knee is not problematic. But if I weighed even 10 pounds heavier than I do now, my knee could become an issue. But it wouldn't be my knee's fault, would it? Mm -mm. It'd be my weight's fault. So I don't have a knee problem. I'd have a weight problem. So when people come in and they're like, oh, my gosh, I've got a knee problems. I've got back problems. I've got hip problems. I've got feet problems. Outside of a, of a degenerative issue or an injury, it's usually predicated on your weight. I think 90% of the time. I'll even give 10% to the anomalies. But 90% of the time, bad back, bad knees, bad hips, bad blank, bad blank, bad blank. Insert well, how much extra weight are we holding? And this is this is like an, I wanted to show you this diagram because this is a picture of an actual knee. And this is the importance of one pound. I don't even know what, I don't even have anything on my desk that weighs one pound. Like one pound is not very much. So here's a stack of books. I would say this is probably three pounds, right? So this would be, let's do some quick math here, Jay. Let's say this is around a pound. Like three overweight minds is a pound. So if I lost that, it was going to take four pounds of pressure. It's going to take a stack this big of these off of my body and off of my knee. Like that's the importance and the value of being healthy and being fit and being having good mobility. So we talk about weight loss all the time. We, we give, you know, analogies on, you know, intermittent fasting. We talk about you know, having, you know, the right tools and too much, too often, wrong combination. Um, these foods are going to be better for you. Increase your protein, more mobility, more sleep, more all of those things. But this is the reason, right? Other than looking cute in, 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 the, in, the, in the summer dresses and the tanky tops and stuff this year, this is the real reason. This is the reason that we're trying to get you to get that extra weight off. So th do some simple math. If you, have, if you have 10 extra pounds, just 10 only, and every one pound is worth four pounds of pressure, 10 extra pounds is worth how many pounds of extra pressure? 40. 40 pounds of extra pressure. Now let's go let's do some crazy math. Uh, what if you're 50 pounds overweight? All right? 200 pounds of extra pressure. That's crazy. That's why your knees hurt. That's why your hips hurt. That's why your back hurts. That's why your shoulders hurt. That's why you get tired. That's why you get so sore. That's why you have trouble riding the bike, doing the hike, taking the stairs. Like it's it's the little things. One pound, four pounds of pressure. Just wanted you to see that. I don't want to. I don't want to overly harp on that. But I think sometimes in life, when we actually get a visual of what it is that we're talking about makes a huge difference. So that should really be ringing home for you. Okay, 
So today we're going to talk about motivation. But before we do that, I want to show you this little diagram. So you can see the balloon on the right, the red balloon says discipline. And that discipline just kind of staying right there in the middle where it needs to be. And you'll notice the motivation comes up, gets through the top, and then the, the flame goes out and it drops all the way back to the bottom. That's really how motivation works in our life. Like this is why I'm always talking about discipline being the driving force for how we win, how we get the results that we want to get predicated on discipline. Motivation is amazing, right? Sometimes you can see on the left-hand side, it's going to shoot up. You're going to get super juiced, but then it's always that flame is going to burn out because it's a non-sustainable, non-sustainable like metric, if you will, non-sustainable force that, that you're trying to use to get to an outcome. So let's dive into motivation. What is motivation and do we really need it? So that's really the key question. Like, so we're going to define what it is, the different types of motivation, and we're going to come to a conclusion at the end of, do we need motivation? If we do, if we don't, how we're going to use it, how we, how we allow motivation to be a driving force in our life, how we use it as a tool and not as a, not as a, a necessity. So motivation basically refers to the driving force behind your actions, your desires, and your behaviors. It's the internal and external factors that stimulate you to pursue goals, tasks, and outcomes. Motivation is what energizes you, directs you in the, in the direction, direction in the direction, of your behaviors and sustains your efforts over time. But there's two types of motivation. There's intrinsic and extrinsic motivation. So intrinsic motivation is the type of motivation that comes from within oneself, right? Intrinsic. It involves engaging in activities because they're inherently rewarding to you. They're enjoyable to you. They fulfill something that, that's inside of you. An example of intrinsic motivation would be like pursuing a hobby because it brings you personal satisfaction, um, studying a subject out of genuine interest. And then extrinsic motivation is the motivation that comes from the external forces in your life, such as reward, punishment, social pressure. And it involves engaging in activities to earn a reward or avoid a negative consequence. Examples of extrinsic motivation include like when you were in high school, when you studied to earn good grades so you could get rewarded with the praise of your parents, working to receive a paycheck. So doing a good job at your work so that they pay you at the end of the week. Or, or, or exercising, um, preparing, practicing in order to win a competition because you're going to get the trophy at the end of that. So weight loss kind of falls into this extrinsic motivating realm because you're trying to get a reward and you're trying to avoid the punishment of being out of shape. But there also has to be some intrinsic value in that if you're really going to succeed. And this is where this gets a little bit interesting. It's an extrinsic motivating factor, but you're going you're gonna to have to cultivate or manufacture some in, intrinsic internal interest in the actual subject matter, which is you, your weight loss, your success, your happiness in order for you to get fulfilled on that. So motivation can be influenced by various factors. So one of those factors is personal goals and values. You guys hear me talk about my values are more important. My core values are what drive all of my decisions. So my motivation is to make sure that I'm living by the standards of my core values and my personal goals, I don't negotiate with those so therefore, my personal goals are strong enough to, so that I can use motivation when it's available to get to those goals and to exercise those values. But also, I have to couple that with the discipline that I talked about earlier. The second thing that can influence um, motivation is expectations of success or failure. This really goes along with your standards of life. Like, what are your standards? What are your expectations of yourself? I think a lot of times we think about what our expectations of other people are, but we tend to give ourselves a pass on our own personal expectations. And so when you look at that from that perspective, 
It's what are your personal expectations of success or failure? And so for those of us that keep our promises, we do what we say we're going to do. We set a goal and we go after it. We are, we're, we're playing the long game and not the short game. We know that we're going to get that success as long as we don't quit. Others that have broken so many promises that they're no longer even promises, they're just ideas or thoughts, have subjected themselves to the failure of that over and over again, and that can be demotivating. But for somebody who is not breaking promises, for somebody who's not falling back on their excuses and and the lower level frequencies of their lives, the thought of failure can be absolutely extrinsically, extrinsically motivating because you don't want those feelings. You don't want the feeling of not doing what it is you say you're going to do. And I, always, I think about it in this analogy. If I tell somebody that I love that I'm going to do something, I make them a promise, and then I don't fulfill that promise, man, that hits me hard because my, my word is, is very important to me. I have that same exact feeling if I make myself a promise. Most people don't because they've they've broken so many promises to themselves that the feeling of, man, I wish I wouldn't, the sadness and, and the, the, the contempt that you have for your, your lack of, of, of willingness to, to do what it is you said you were going to do has kind of gone away. A third thing is past experiences and achievements. The more you win, the more you want to win. The more success you have, the more success you're going to want to have. And this is why people struggle who have not achieved the results that they desire to achieve in the time frame that they set out. So the analogy is this. Most people underestimate what they can achieve in a lifetime and overestimate what they can achieve in a very short period of time. So most people who have a weight loss goal, let's stay on that theme, they overestimate the capabilities of what they're going to be able to lose in such a small time frame. And then they get discouraged because they didn't lose those those 50 pounds in three weeks, right? Very unrealistic number, but that's how the human brain works. And if we can recall past experiences, everything that we've achieved in our life is probably taking a little bit longer than we thought it would. You know what I mean? Like all the great things you have have taken a little bit longer to achieve than we really originally thought they would. And so if you can start to recall past experiences and achievements, and what that looked like to get to those, that can be motivating because you can you can show yourself a pattern of time necessary to receive outcome. The other thing is going to be social norms, like cultural norms. Unfortunately, many of us are driven by screens, right? We're driven by the world of TikTok and Instagram and Facebook and social media. And that can be very demotivating because you will, if you look at that and you and you view that as reality, which that's what that's what you're being programmed to believe. You're being programmed to believe that social media, the screens you watch, are reality. I want you guys to think about this for a second. Have you noticed how almost every video you see on social media almost seems staged? Like even these radical things, you're like, oh my God, I can't believe that happened. Isn't it, isn't it peculiar to you, the framing of the situation? Start to look at things differently from social media, and I think it'll really help you. It's like, oh, my God, I can't believe that happened. But there just happened to be a camera set up with either a person behind it or a tripod and a, and a, and a play button in somebody's hand where this, this, this perfectly orchestrated event was acted out and the outcome was this Oh, wow, this shocking thing, almost like a dramatic cinema moment. Have you noticed that that's what social media is now? It's really not like, you know, pictures of puppies doing weird stuff. And there's some of that as well. And there is some like, there is some real raw, uncut stuff. But for the most part, it's all manipulated content, right? Your life's not manipulated content. Your life is happening in real time. These, these things you're watching and these people you're watching and these scenarios you're watching on your screens aren't happening in real time. They're orchestrated, edited events that are made to seem real time so that you put yourself in that place and then you start the comparison model of, well, my life doesn't look like that. 
that's where mo that's where social media can be uber unmotivating but there's also some really cool stuff on there as well right there's also some really motivational videos of you know great speakers and you know people doing really you know awesome feats like i love watching like 90 year old grandmothers like you know lift weights and like do really cool stuff like that can be a motivating factor or you know, hearing somebody, you know, just use motivating language can be really powerful. So just be very careful how you're using your screens to either motivate yourself or demotivate yourself. The next thing that can influence um, motivation is going to be environmental factors, right? Just the world around you. Like we see the world as we are, not as it is. And so the environment that you are surrounding yourself with is going to influence your motivation. If you're, if you're around people that have a demotivated life, use demotivated language, use negative language, use, you know, drama, all the, all the things, right? That's going to be problematic for your level of motivation. But if you're around somebody that when you walk out of that room, you're like, I feel like I just had three cups of espresso and I'm ready to run through a brick wall. Like make sure you're surrounding yourself with people like that that you want to be, you know, extrinsically motivated by to create some internal fire within you. And the last one is going to be your emotional state, your mindset, right? What you're excited about, what you're fearful of, what you're enthusiastic about, what you're challenged by. And I believe that your mindset, as we all talk about this at, at nauseum, um, is the most important thing on your journey to wellness, weight loss, success, health, wealth, happiness, it's going to be predicated on your emotional state. And we have been programmed to believe that normal behaviors are now emotional problems. Think about that. We've been programmed to now believe in the world that we live in 2024, that normal emotional feelings are problems and that we need to have external, you know, mediation to help us with those particular problems. Like, you know, our feelings have now become diseases. Our emotions have now become disease states where now we identify as someone who is blank, someone who has this emotional, their feelings, their emotions, they're the same things you felt your entire life. They've now just been labeled. And through that labeling, it's made you feel like you've now got a problem. So I want, I want to be very clear on this to you guys. Being sad is normal. Being happy is normal. Being upset is normal. Being elated is normal. Being a little bit down is normal. Being way up is normal. Like there are fluctuations in your emotional state predicated on the quality of your mindset. And the quality of your mindset is predicated on the environment that you've created for yourself. And so if you're experiencing emotions and feelings and thoughts that are not in alignment with how you want to feel, and you allow yourself to be labeled as somebody who has a problem, a disease, a, um, you know, a, something that needs a, a medicative outcome, you're going to struggle. Because you don't have the awareness to understand that these are just normal feelings. Losing weight is a challenge, right? We're supposed to be challenged in life. Like, I think we've gotten to a place in the world that we live in today where challenges are just booky and bad and all the, the millennial words that you want to throw on top of them, like, they're bad. It's, not, it's bad to, to be challenged. It's bad to be stressed. It's bad to be, you know, feel adversity. It's bad to to feel a little bit overwhelmed. You know, I tell Marissa all the time, there's no better J than a pissed off J. And I don't mean pissed off in a in an angry fashion, but there's no better me than when I feel like I'm being challenged. When I feel like I'm being like you're trying to overwhelm me. Like I don't no better me than when I'm a little bit stressed out. Because I understand that those aren't problems. Those are cues those are emotional, mental, psychological cues that I need to get straight, that I need to get this thing in alignment with what it is that I want to be, who it is that I want to be. So that there's no better me than when those situations get, get presented to me, because I'm going to turn every one of those into an opportunity. And you can too. 
But if you start to label yourself as somebody who has those problems, those aren't problems. Those are, those are gifts. Like stress creates power. Stress creates strength. How do you think you get stronger? You stress your muscle. How do you think you get faster if you're a runner? You stress your muscle. You stress your cardiovascular system. How do you think you get smarter? You stress your neurological system and you build new neural pathways and you get faster and sharper and smarter. The stress is not a bad thing. We label stress as this like disease state now. Did I get a little bit off off tangent? You bet I did. Because I get passionate about this crap because I don't want you to be labeling yourself as something that is really going to bring you no value, but it is associated with your motivation because if you're allowing a little bit of stress to demotivate you as opposed to get you fired up, like stress gets me fired up. Stress is a motivator to me, not a demotivator. So it's all about your perception of how you think about things. So let's talk about why we lose motivation. Why do we lose motivation? And more importantly, how do we get it back? So understanding motivation is essential for achieving your personal and professional goals, your life. It plays a crucial role in determining your persistence, your effort level, your overall give a crap, your performance in the pursuit of desired outcomes. I never say, screw it, F it. It's not worth it. If, if I'm involved, it's worth it. Hear me, let me say that again. If I'm involved, it's worth it. Whatever that is. If I want to lose five pounds, it's worth it. If I want to get, if I want to get, if I want to make more money, it's worth it. If I, whatever I want to do, if I'm involved, if you're involved, it's got to be worth it. So I never say, screw it, F it. No, it's not worth it. Are you kidding me? The thought that you think something that you're involved in is not worth it? That should be mind blowing to you. Right? That's how you lose motivation. And that's not a, that, that's a, that's just a belief system. So we can lose motivation in a lot of ways. Most of you guys lose motivation by such simple ways. You get burned out. I've never been burned out. Never. Why? Because I don't believe it. I don't believe it. I've never been overtrained. Like this in, in the war in the fitness world, it's like, oh, you're overtrained. And no, I'm under recovery. This body is meant to train. We see it all the time. We see people do incredible feats. Right. I watched a guy when I was in high school. I, I still think about this. I didn't know tomorrow. I don't think I was in high school yet. Maybe like elementary, maybe even just little kid stuff. There was a guy named Terry Fox, and he ran across America with one leg. He had some, I can't remember the disease state that he had or why he lost his leg, but he lost his leg and he ran across America with a prosthetic thing. And they did a documentary on him, and it was fascinating. Fascinating. I think about that dude today. They didn't have the prosthetics that they have that they have today. This was this was like in the 80s. Dude ran across America. Terry Fox. Remember, like it was yesterday. And I can't get my butt outside. I can't go to the gym. I got two feet. Terry would die for these two feet. So I can't I don't get burned out. I don't get overwhelmed. Another reason is, is losing or not developing clear. Like clear reasons why you're doing what you're doing. Like I've given you a couple today. I showed you the picture of that knee. If you're 50 pounds overweight, here's my promise. My promise is this. You will lose mobility at some point. You will be that person in the airport, in the wheelchair, who can't walk to the gate. You will be. You'll be that person who can't play with their grandkids. You'll be with that person who can't go on vacation because they can't walk. <clears throat> That's just factual. You've got to get clear about what it is you want your life to look like. Like, I'm very clear on what I want my life to look like. I do not, will not have mobility issues when I'm 60, 70, 80, 90 years old. I'm going to work. I'm going to work to make sure that those things don't occur. We lose motivation because we get overwhelmed. It's kind of what I talked about earlier. 
we get overwhelmed because we look at stress. We look at challenges. We look at things that aren't easy as problems instead of opportunities. And we allow ourselves to get exacerbated mentally. Your body's capable. You, you get exacerbated mentally and you don't do the things you need to do. And then a setback. A setback will, will just destroy motivation. I did, it's like I didn't, it's like I think about it from this perspective. I didn't get what I wanted, so I'm going to take my ball and go home. That's what a setback is. Instead of just working harder. Like I look at this as an analogy. Like I look at it from a sports perspective. If I ever in my life growing up saw somebody who I thought was better than me, I didn't withdraw and like take my ball and go home. Like I wanted to get as close to that person as humanly possible because I was going to learn everything I could. And I was going to get better than them by watching them and then outperforming them. Right? But not being, not being good enough in a certain setting or failing or not doing, it's always predicated on our lack of effort. I wasn't as good as that person because my effort wasn't what it needed to be. So I had two choices. I could keep giving the same amount of effort and boo-hoo and not get what I wanted. Or I could watch that effort and say, well, that my effort needs to increase. So start looking at setbacks as questions on how can I perform at a higher level. Now let's talk about five steps that are going to help you regain motivation. Because motivation is, it's not permanent. As that balloon showed you earlier, it's going to go up and down. It's going to be high at some points. It's going to be really low at some points. How can you create it? How can you manufacture it? So one way is to reflect on your goals. More importantly, I like to say, why do you, why do you start this? So take some time to reassess your, your goals. Why, why is this important to you? Why did you start in the first place? Why was this so meaningful that you said yes to it? And then make a decision from that place. Because you can remember why you said yes to this, why you said yes to wanting to lose weight, why you said yes to taking care of yourself. Then it changes and it gets you more in alignment with your circumstances and your aspirations. It removes all of the nonsense. Number two, oftentimes we look at, again, I'm going to go back to the analogy of 50 pounds of weight loss. Let's just call it 100 pounds. It's a bigger analogy. If I said to you, Go, you know, the, the, it's the, I've used this analogy before. There's a hundred pound boulder in the corner of the room. Go get the hundred pound boulder and take it from that corner and put it over in the other corner. Like you could go and you could, you could try to pick it up. You could try to drag it. You could try to push it. You could try to whatever. You wouldn't be able to pick it up. It's gnarly. It's got jagged edges. It's dirty. It's filthy. But if I went over and I broke that hundred pound boulder into one 100 pound little rocks, and I said, every day, I want you to go get me a one pound rock and take it over and put it in that corner. You could do that till the end of time. Some, I mean, honestly, some days you, you could you probably even do it faster than one at a time. But it's about breaking those, those boulders down into rocks and not allowing yourself to be overwhelmed by the magnitude of needing to lose 100 pounds. Like that's daunting to anybody. Like if I said, I'm going to go run 100 miles, like, holy, that's a, long, that's a long way. But if I said, I'm going to run a mile and then run another mile and then run another mile and then run another mile, it's a, it's a, it's a progressible, incremental goal that I can achieve. And every time I get to another mile, it's going to boost my motivation and give me more power. But if I just keep going to that corner and keep trying to pick up that gnarly big nasty 100 pound rock and i don't move it at all i'm going to lose motivation so break those break those giant boulders down into small rocks and then you got to find inspiration more importantly i like to call it manufacturing urgency you have to seek sources of inspiration that resonate with you you have to be able to create those this could be reading books that motivate you, watching motivational videos, listening to podcasts, getting around somebody who, when they speak, makes you want to run through a brick wall, surrounding yourself with positive, motivational, like 
driven, enthusiastic people. Like I call it the manufacturing of urgency. The most successful people I know can create urgency. They don't, it doesn't have to be even real. Like I can create a scenario in my brain where it's me against whatever, like the world. And that if I don't do these things, they're going to win. And I absolutely refuse to lose. So I'm going to do those things. That's a kind of a grandiose version of what it is. But I can create urgency based on my standards and my values that I talked about earlier. Because I want to feel that feeling of what it feels like to keep the promises to myself. I, most people that I encounter have no urgency. They don't have urgency in the way they think, the way they talk, the way they move, the way they, the way they communicate with the world around them. They don't have urgency with their, their, their relationships, their, their love, their family, their jobs. Like it's a pretty, it's almost like we're living in this zombie apocalypse of people just, just meandering through the world in this like blacked out version of themselves, zero urgency. But the most successful people I know are urgent. And urgent doesn't mean out of control. I think that urgency gets a bad rap. Urgency means disciplined, focused action. Like motivated movement, motivated thought, inspired movement. It's, you ever been around somebody that they just looked inspired? They moved in an inspired fashion. They communicated in an inspired fashion. They even looked inspired. And the way they dressed, you're like, I don't mean, that makes, you, you've been around somebody like that? Probably very, probably very minimally, because not there's not many of them out there. So you find one of those jokers, and you move in that direction. So if you find yourself and you're and you're in that herd mentality, you're going to lose motivation. Right? You're going to lose motivation. You've got to be able to manufacture some urgency in your life, guys. I mean, it's got to be important enough to you to want to manufacture urgency. It starts with language patterns. You got to care. You got to use inspiring, powerful language. The next thing is creating or being involved in a supportive environment that influences you to want to be better. So you're here. If, if I'm not going to do anything, I am going to try my damnedest to try to influence you to want to be better, to want to live a life that is so unbelievably amazing and abundant that you can't even fathom how it's going to feel. That's what I want for you. I want you to feel that. I want you to live that. I want you to be that. But if you're experiencing the opposite of that, when you're not listening to this call, when you're not at the studio around the energy, that's going to be problematic because you're influenced by your environment. If you're around people who are distracted, negatively influenced, disorganized, like just living that zombified life. You've got to make some changes in your environment. You've got to get around, around people that have goals, that are encouraging and supportive, that want to see you win, that aren't afraid to say, hey, hey, that's not going to get it done. You're better than that. Right? You got to do it. The last one is you got to take care of yourself. So here's the question I ask in this. How are you treating you? Remember to prioritize your health and your life because your physical and your mental well-being, for lack of a better term, play a significant role in your motivation. When you're moving well, eating well, sleeping well, thinking well, talking well, around people that, that are having that same, isn't, I mean, can you feel it? Can you feel the flow of motivation, inspiration, enthusiasm, abundance? But you can also feel the opposite, right? When you're not eating really well, it's pizza time two or three nights a week, a few too many cold beers, right? Not sleeping, not going to the gym, not taking your walks, not surrounding yourself with positive, powerful conversations, right? Not eating, not re exercising regularly, not managing your stress. When you don't take care of yourself, your body doesn't take care of you. But when you take care of yourself, your, your mental and physical bodies, emotional states will be so much more in alignment with resiliency. We talk about that all the time and 
inspiration and motivation that you'll be able to overcome the challenges because you'll look at them as an opportunity. And so if you'll think about these steps I talked about today, and you can you can navigate those and weave those into your life and really pay attention to what it is that, that's, that you're surrounding yourself with, how you're thinking, how you're moving, how you're eating, how you're speaking, all of those things, that's going to be, that's going to, that's going to diminish the motivational fluctuations naturally. And so if you'll do those things, you're going to get naturally more motivated. And then you're going to couple that with the discipline that we talk about, the 90-10 lifestyle. And then you're going to be absolutely unstoppable. And this is the reason that most of you that aren't having success aren't having success. You don't have the mo- you don't have enough sustained motivation and your discipline's not where it needs to be. So let me ask you a question. What do you think kicks in when motivation fades? Discipline. Right? Discipline is the consistent factor. Discipline's the consistent metric on the flow chart. Where is your discipline level? If you're living a 90-10 lifestyle, 90% discipline, 10% freedom, and motivation starts to wane a little bit, you're still okay. But if you're living a 50-50 and you lose that motivation, what happens? Then everything becomes noticeable, right? Then, then, we're, then we're gaining the 10 pounds. Then we're, we're not sleeping well. Then we don't feel good. Then our joints hurt. Then we're sick then we're depressed, then we're overwhelmed, right? It's like, it's all connected. So if you just pay attention to the metrics and where they are, like what kind of lifestyle am I living? Where's my motivational factors, the external motivational factors? Who am I surrounding myself? What are my inputs? How am I thinking, speaking, acting, all of those things? You're going to be able to dictate where your motivation is. And even for me, like motivation is not always there, but in, in, in lieu of motivation, my discipline's all that matters. I do it anyway. Motivate, when I feel motivated, it's nice. It's awesome. But when I feel unmotivated, nothing changes. Because the consistent cofactor is what? Discipline. So get your discipline where it needs to be, and your motivation is going to be easier to manipulate, it's going to be easier to manufacture. And then when it's absent, you're going to win anyway, because you're such a 90-10 disciplined person that the systems are already in place for you. Make sense? All right. Can you think about a situation you were just in that was demotivating? How did you respond to that? Like, what were your thought patterns? How did you get out of it? Like, Are you still stuck in it? What can you do used on the information I gave you today to get yourself to a better place where you're feeling more motivated? What are the action steps that you can take? Like action is always going to be the first thing, right? You're never going to think yourself out of a situation. You're going to have to take some action, right? That action might be a conversation, right? That action might be like having some dialogue back and forth, but it's never going to just be sitting in silence and like hoping that it goes away. You're going to have to create the environment that is conducive for you feeling more motivated, more inspired. Uh, and so the things to ask yourself are, okay, what's my current discipline level? What's my current motivation level? And look at those like on a, on a, flow, on a ch- or, you know, movable chart. And then you'll know exactly what it is that you need to do. Most of the time, it's going to be taking the necessary actions that you know you need to take. And like I said a while ago, it's like you're always going to feel more motivated when you're doing the things that are motivating. And I know that sounds a little bit silly, but like I know when you eat well that you move better. I know when you move better, you eat better. Like they're all connected. When you sleep better, you think better, you move better, you talk better, you make better decisions with your food. Like it's all correlated and connected. And so if you're finding yourself like not connected, Find the broken link in the chain and then work on that particular link because that fixing that link is going to be the easiest thing you could do. And, and think about the controllables. Like I, every person listening to me right now, it's three o'clock here, six o'clock on the East Coast. Some of you guys probably haven't even eaten dinner yet. Now, most of you guys probably haven't. Your, your dinner choice tonight 
what you put in your body from this moment on will dictate your motivation and your discipline level moving into tomorrow. It's that important. And it's that easily manipulatable and controllable. Every single one of us can control our intake tonight. Easy. You're in charge of what you put in your mouth, right? And if you make those good decisions tonight, that's going to roll over into tomorrow morning. When you get up, you're going to get up. You're going to feel more rested. You're going to feel not having a sugar hangover, right? You didn't have the booze tonight. You're going to get up. You're going to feel like going for a walk, going to the gym, getting some movement in. All of those things, that's going to lead to a better morning. That's going to lead to better decisions when you do break your fast in the morning. What am I going to consume now? Because I feel so great from yesterday. You're going to have better conversations. You're going to have better communication. You're going to feel better about yourself. All of those things will start to like roll over and over and over and over again. But we got to make the decisions, right? We got to do the little things that 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 create the life that we really want to live. Um, question, what are the things that cause you, yourself, not to feel motivated if you ever don't feel motivated? Um, there's no, I don't think there doesn't have to be a causative factor. Like this is what I talked about earlier. We have gotten so programmed that if we don't feel special, that there's got to be a problem. I don't feel special today. So there must be an issue. I, I should post on social media that I'm having anxiety or I'm whatever. You're not going to feel special every day. As special as I think I am, I don't feel special every day. Some days I get up and I'm like, okay, this is how it's going to be. Right? Some days I get up and the last thing I want to do is go for a three-mile walk. The last thing I want to do is meditate. The last thing I want to do is go lift weights. The last thing I want to do, but I just do it anyway. Because I know that if I just do it anyway, that's going to kick the motivational level up for me. Like I don't have, I never have a bad or unmotivated day, but there's times in the day, like there's moments in the day. There's everything where every human on the planet doesn't feel a great level of motivation. But that's what that's the important. Those are the important days because those are the days that matter. Because when you perform on those days, because that's your standard, that's who you are. Right. Just because I'm unmotivated, I don't get to go. Well, first of all, I can't go in my kitchen and eat nonsense because I don't have nonsense in my house. But I'm not going to feel unmotivated, get in my car, go to a drive through, abuse myself with food and then not go work out and then drink 27 beers and then sleep like, like that, that's just, it's such a defeating way to look at life. So when I don't feel motivated, right, and, and, and by unmotivated, that can just be sometimes you don't feel like doing it, right? Like we're humans. Like I'm a human. Some days I just don't feel like doing it. But I do it anyway. You know what I mean? Like I just do it anyway. Like there's going to be times when you just don't want to do something. But if your goals are important enough to you, right? And here, let me, I'll give you an example. One of the reasons I do what I do is because of you guys. You guys will never know if I don't, if I don't go for my walk tonight, if I don't work out tonight. You'll never know. You won't have a clue. Zero. You have no, there's no way you'll know. But I'll know. And that's more important to me than you know it. And I don't mean that in a negative way. I'll know. Right? And I refuse, refuse to be that. That's not who I am. Right? That's not who I am. Jay Nix, I don't break promises. It's like the analogy. There was this, there was this, these two little boys. And one of them, there was like this, I'm going to get, I'm going to screw it up. So I'm just going to make it my own things. There was a piece of candy. And this, the teacher came in and asked one of the little boys and said, um, the candy was gone. And he said, did you eat that candy? And the one little boy said, I'm not lying. I didn't eat the candy. I'm not lying. I didn't eat the candy. He came in and asked the next little boy, the candy was gone. And the little boy said, I don't lie. See the difference? So the, the first little boy said, I'm not lying. Meaning like, I'm not lying this time. The second little boy said, I don't lie. That's an identity. He identifies as a, as a human, the little boy that doesn't lie. And that's important, right? Because if I'm not lying this time, 
maybe I did last time. Maybe I will again. I don't give myself that out. And that's how important I think language is. I'm not the kind of person. I don't break promises to you, to myself, to anybody. Just don't. Right? And that's, that's motivated in of itself. When I don't feel motivated, that's where the discipline comes in. Like that's why, my, that's why it's so important to me to make sure my discipline is at a high level. 90% discipline, 10% freedom. Right? So that's, that's the answer to the day that you don't feel like doing it. And truth be told, there could be a bunch of those days or there could be a few of those days. Like I honestly don't give it that much energy because it doesn't matter. I mean, like some days, yeah, I'm just chipping. I'm, I'm firing on all cylinders. It couldn't be any better, right? I could fly if I wanted to. Those were great days. Those were fun days. Those those days, those are the days that, 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 you know, I feel like, you know, really cool. But sometimes, most of the time, it's the days where I don't feel like doing it that I get the most done. And that's because I'm disciplined. And I'm not disciplined for any other reason than that's how I identify. I identify as a disciplined person. Like when you look at me, you will see discipline. You'll see discipline with the way I move. I move with a sense of urgency. I speak with authority and a sense of direction. I, I communicate at an extremely high level. I don't, I don't make excuses. I don't manipulate information. I don't manipulate myself. I don't allow myself to make excuses. I don't use negative language. Like you'll find if you just listen to me long enough, you'll find that I am the kind of person that moves with urgency. Everywhere I go, there's a reason and a purpose for where I'm going and why I'm going there. Even if it's in a casual setting. Like I'm never lackluster about anything because my life's too cool and too important. If I see you at a party and I have a conversation with you, we're going to have a really awesome conversation. Because it's an opportunity. It's a chance for me to get to connect deeply with another human. And if you're not good at conversations, I'm probably going to go find somebody else to have a conversation with. And I don't mean that in a negative way, but it's too important, right? And you have to be the same way. Like if you meet somebody and they're not interested in having a conversation with you, go find somebody who is. Everything's important. It all matters. Like that's why I don't get unmotivated because I'm get, this life that I get to experience is so unbelievable because I've realized one thing. I'm creating it. I'm responsible for the outcome. I'm responsible for my level of motivation. And if I know I'm responsible, that means I can create it. That means if I wake up in the morning and I don't feel motivated, what do I have to do? I have to create that motivation. What do, the one thing that I know that creates motivation for me is moving my body. That's it. That's the one thing that, that I know will create motivation for me. It's just moving my body. So you got to find a trigger for you. You know, the last thing I'm going to do if I feel unmotivated is to do an unmotivating activity. So I hope that answered that question. I want to take a quick moment to talk about the sponsor of this episode. It is very dear and near and close to my heart because it is Lori's company, Spa Star. If you ever had the opportunity to watch someone create something from a thought or a vision and make this magical thing actually come to life. Well, then you'll know why I'm so extremely proud of her and why I'm so excited to have her sponsoring the Thrive Forever Fit Show. If you've listened to my podcast, then you probably heard her on episode 259. If you haven't heard that, I would go listen to episode 259 as soon as you finish this episode. She talks about the story of, of how she created it, the, the adversity she overcame, the challenges that she worked through, and just the inspirational story that I know you're absolutely going to love. But what Spa Star is, it's, it's a, a luxury wrap, and it was created as a, a spa wrap for people who were getting beauty treatments. But what we found out is it is a piece for everyday life. People are wearing it as swimsuit cover-ups, uh, resort wear, just to get ready in the mornings or for that special event. It is the most unique piece, and I've actually, I've actually worn this thing several times. I was the actual first model for this. Maybe I'll show you guys some photos of that, Fred, when the time is right. But it is such a cool creation called the Get Ready Wrap by Spa Star. And because you're a listener, you get 15% off today because you support me. So just go to spastar.net 
spastar.net, the word spa, the word star, .net. And at the checkout, enter Thrive15, T-H-R-I-V-E 15, and you're going to get 15% off of your Get Ready Wrap. So many of my clients already have these and absolutely love them. We're selling them all over the country and all over the world, for that matter, to high-end luxury spas and to people just like you that are using them inside of their own homes. They're traveling with them. They're using them at the pool. It's so really just unbelievably cool to see and, and witness, and I'm so blessed to be a part of it. And I'm so blessed to have Lori actually sponsoring my podcast, which I think is really, really cool. So go check out Spa Star. I know you're going to love it. It is the coolest thing ever. And guys, this isn't just for ladies. This is one of the coolest gifts you could get your, any female in your life for that matter. If Lori hadn't created it, I would buy them for her as a gift to show her my love and appreciation. So dudes, if you're listening and you need to get a gift, for your significant other or some special person in your life, go to spastar.net, grab a get ready wrap. There's all kinds of colors. There's black, there's sage, there's a berry color. There's a, um, gosh, I just went blank. There's a kind of a greeny kind of avocado-y color. Really cool. You're definitely going to love these, I promise. So go to spastar.net, check it out, support Lori. And Lori, thank you for sponsoring the show. All right, let's get to the action. I hope you guys enjoyed that show as much as I did. And I want to say from the bottom of my heart, I am so thankful and so grateful that you take the time to listen to the show every week. And it means the absolute world to me. If you've got a little bit of time, it would mean everything if you would go and give the show a five-star review on whatever platform you're listening on, as well as share it with a friend or family member that you think might find value in the show. And again, I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for being an awesome human and listening to the Overweight Mind podcast. Thanks, and we'll see you again next week. All right, bye.